Good evening. My name is Siva Kassanathan, and I'm a student with the University of Washington's Engage program, here to welcome you to our event today. I'm a graduate student at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and I study genetics, specifically I study parts of the human genome that have been uh, unexplored, and largely unexplored at this point. And I get to have this opportunity to be here tonight because of a special collaboration between Town Hall and the UW's Engage program. Together, they host a series called UW Science Now as part of the Seattle Science Lecture Series. Our speaker's program will run about 25 minutes, including five minutes for your questions. If you have a question, we ask that you come to the microphones at either edge of the stage so we can pick you up for the recording that we're making. Before I introduce our first guest, I'd like to mention some other events from our science series. First of all, please join us tonight for a talk by John Hall, who will discuss his death-defying adventures in the pursuit of understanding the impact of climate change. That's tonight at 7.30, following these Engage talks. Also, the next two talks in the UW Science Now speaker series will be right here on April 3rd, starting at 6 p.m. Allison Weber and Rachel Hutto will talk about the neuroscience of vision. And now, to our first guest. Maddie Smith is a PhD student in the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington. And today, she's going to tell us about the role waves are playing in changing polar oceans. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Maddie Smith. Thank you, Siva, for that introduction, and thank you all so much for being here tonight. So, as Siva mentioned, tonight I want to tell you about some really interesting things that have been happening in the Arctic Ocean. This picture is uh, one that I took when I was on a ship doing research about a year and a half ago in the Arctic Ocean. And so I'm looking out from the bridge on the top of the ship, and so you can see the mast in the middle of the frame. And behind that, on the ocean, is this really wild looking stuff that is actually ice. Um, so these are small pieces of ice, and they're small and round, and so we actually call them pancakes. And even just the observance of this type of ice on the surface is indicative of the changes that we've been seeing in the Arctic Ocean. So to start, I want to ask you how many of you have seen before this image or one like it of a polar bear stranded on a piece of sea ice in the Arctic? Yes, raise your hand. Uh, pretty much everyone. <laughs> this image has become a really quintessential image for climate change and global warming in our society. So, what this means is that I don't need to tell you that the Arctic is melting. You probably already know that we, we're losing ice in the Arctic, it's changing really rapidly, and that this is concerning for animals like polar bears that are symbols for us of this unique environment. But what I want to tell you about tonight is that it's not as simple as we picture when we see this image, that it's not just warming causing the loss of ice in the Arctic. There's a lot, lot, actually a lot of other factors that are leading to the loss of sea ice. Uh, so in particular, my research is looking at the, um, how waves are causing changes. So I'll tell you about how um, waves are contributing to the loss of ice. So in general, we know that the Arctic is cold and frozen. So this is a picture that I love because it was the first time I was standing on top of the ocean. So in this picture, look might look like I'm on land to some, but I'm actually standing on top of this huge piece of ice that's over miles of water underneath. Um, so this type of ice is uh, a large flow, um, a multi-year flow that used to be much more common in the Arctic Ocean. Um, so it's really thick and old, uh, and so would uh, cover the, oh, there's a problem with the, this isn't, sorry. Um, so, it's a, uh, so it's a large piece of ice and it's many years old and this would form what we call the polar ice cap. Oh, this isn't working. Okay, so in 1980, uh, much more of the Arctic was covered in ice. So this is an image of the extent of ice in September, uh, where we see ice covering the majority of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, so between Russia and Alaska, you can see that almost all of the basin is covered in this ice that would be thick um, and old like in the previous image. But in recent years, we've seen a significant decline in the amount of sea ice. So this map is from 2012, which is one of the years of lowest ice extent that we've seen in recent years. 
And so you can see that compared to before, there's a lot more open area around Alaska and Russia, so the, where the, land, the ice doesn't now come to the land. And we can see these changes over time. Um, so from 1980, like uh, in the image on the left, to recent years, the amount of ice in September has decreased by almost half. Um, so this is an area that's equivalent to about a third of the U.S. So if you picture an area all the way from Canada down to Mexico, California to Texas, this is the amount of area that used to freeze up this time of year that's no longer frozen. So this is a massive area, and um, the reason we look at September in particular is because this is the time of year when the extent of ice is the lowest. It will freeze up again over the winter um, and then melt out again in the coming spring. But we can see similar change, changes in the trends of amount of ice in these other months, as well as in the changes in the thickness. And these changes are all part of what we refer to as the New Arctic. So in this New Arctic, we have ice that is both less extensive, but also looks really different. So this picture is of some pancake ice and some smaller bits of ice um, that are more uh, common in this kind of New Arctic that we've been seeing in recent years. Um, and so compared to that image I was showing earlier where we had this huge thick flow that I was standing on, this ice is much thinner, much less stable, and so I probably wouldn't want to stand on this ice. But the scale is approximately right that it's probably about the size of a human. So we know that these changes have been occurring where we have this uh, thinner ice that's less stable and uh, will melt easier come in the spring, but the challenges of predicting how this will continue to change in the future. And unfortunately, it's not as simple as just projecting forward this trend we have from the past. Um, it's a really complex system, so there's a lot more we need to understand. And predicting what the ice is going to look like in the future isn't just a matter of curiosity. It's actually really important for a number of things. Um, so we've already talked about polar bears as being something that's affected by the ice of loss, the loss of ice. Um, so polar bears depend on sea ice for migration and hunting, and so the loss of ice makes it harder for them to get the food that they need to survive. Um, so this mama polar bear and her cute little cub might have a harder time getting the food that they need to survive with loss of ice in recent years. In addition, almost all the other animals that live in the Arctic, from the seals uh, that these polar bears would hunt to the teeny tiny photo phytoplankton that live in the water, they all depend on the sea ice as well, and so they're being affected by the loss of ice in recent years. Of course, us as humans are a species that is also affected by the loss of sea ice, and one of the most obvious uh, ways that we can see this is in the erosion of many coastal Arctic communities. Uh, so the sea, sea ice near the land has protected these coasts for many years, but the loss of ice in recent years makes these coasts really susceptible to wave action which helps erode the permafrost bluffs. So in some areas, the coasts have been eroding really rapidly, up to 50 feet per year. And one of, the, one of these areas that's experiencing these really rapid rates of erosion is the town I'm showing here, which is Schiff-Mareff, Alaska. So in this community, <coughs> Um, this, they've lived here for over 400 years, so many generations, um, but they actually voted just last fall to uproot their entire village um, to move further in, inland uh, because of the erosion that was causing the loss of houses and ruining foundations. And then us in the Pacific Northwest are actually affected by the loss of sea ice, I think a lot more than many of us realize. So the cold polar ice cap helps to regulate our global climate, acting, acting like an air conditioning. So it stabilizes these strong winds around the North Pole, like in the left here, um, that help to regulate our global climate that we are, have been used to for many years. But recent research is indicating that the loss of sea ice can weaken these winds and allows warm air to move north in some places and colder air to move south in others. So while the, cold, uh, the east coast might become colder from this, uh, it's likely making it warmer here on the west coast. So hot summers like we had last year might become more frequent. Uh, but this is actually problematic for uh, ensuring reliable food and water sources in the future. So predicting future climate both in the Arctic and here in the Pacific Northwest is really important. And to do this we need to understand the changes that are happening in the Arctic and in the sea ice. So I just want to make a bit of a side note about um, one of the things that we commonly associate with the loss of sea ice, and that's the, uh, the changes that have been occurring in sea level rise with the, the loss of a lot of ice on Earth. 
But this isn't something that happens with the loss of sea ice, um, but more so from land ice like glaciers and ice sheets. So we can picture glaciers and ice sheets, this land ice, more like ice that's suspended above a glass of water. So it's currently not contributing to the total water level. But as this ice melts, it runs into the, to the ocean or can, into our glass of water, and so the total water level rises. And that's what creates the sea level rise that many coastal communities and especially low-lying islands are concerned about. In comparison with sea ice, the ice is already in the water, so it's more like a glass of water with the ice cubes in it. So as this ice melts, the wa total water level is unchanged. So fortunately, sea level rise isn't something we have to worry about in the Arctic Ocean. But as we've talked about, there's a number of other effects of ice loss that are concerning. And so we want to think about how um, we can predict how ice will be lost in the future. And so this is a really complex process though. Um, and so I wanna try and compare the complexity of this to the complexity of a Rube Goldberg machine. So hopefully many of you have heard of these before. Um, and if you haven't, you should YouTube them later. But they're these uh, pretty fun things that usually start with one uh, kind of specific uh, thing starting the machine and then they end in a simple outcome. But in between there's a complex network of actions and systems that lead to that eventual outcome. So here there's, there's, there's a boxing glove that starts by punching out which knocks over a bowling pin, a bird is released, etc., and ultimately a light bulb is turned on. Similarly, in the Arctic Ocean, we want to understand how the ice is being lost, and we know that uh, part, in part that's due to the warming of the climate, but there's a number of other interactions and systems changing between that we need to consider as well. So we want to understand how the ice at the surface is changing, but we also need to consider changes in the atmosphere above the ice, things with the weather and the sun and the wind that's above the ice as well as changes below the ice in the ocean, how salty it is, how fast it's moving, and how warm it is. So in order to be able to predict um, how the ice will change in the future, we need to consider the interactions of all these different systems. So as you can imagine, the loss of ice results in a lot of changes in the ocean that's below it. Um, so one way that we can Think about, um, so one of the effects of this is increasing the warming that happens in the ocean. And this is similar to why if you're walking outside barefoot on a really hot day, the light concrete will feel a lot better than walking on the black asphalt. And that's because this light concrete is more like an ice covered ocean where it appears really light so it reflects a lot of the incoming heat and stays much cooler. In comparison, the black asphalt appears really dark so it absorbs a lot of heat and gets really hot. So then in the ice-free ocean, as more ice is melting, more of the heat from the sun can be absorbed and we ultimately end up with a warmer ocean. And this is important to understand for as it can uh, melt more ice or delay formation of ice in the future. So then we're beginning to name these different processes uh, that relate these different systems. So now we can consider how solar heating as ice is being lost uh, might increase the input of heat to the ocean and how this might affect loss of ice in the future. There's a number of other changes that will happen in the ocean as well due to the loss of ice. And one in particular that I'm interested in is the emergence of waves in the Arctic. So often when I ask people what they associate with the Arctic Ocean, people say things like ice and polar bears and walruses. Um, but I bet if I asked about the Pacific, a lot of people do picture waves. And this is because something that makes the Arctic really unique as an ocean compared to the other oceans is that it's frozen over. So ice on the surface, like in this picture, seals off the ocean below so that waves can't form. In recent years, as a lot of the ice has been melting, we see emergence of larger areas of open water where there's more distance from the land to the ice and in this area waves can begin to form. So here they might be smaller like on a lake. And then as the ice melts even further and we have these larger areas uh, from the land to the ice edge, even bigger waves can begin to form, more like we see in other oceans. So this relationship between in Increasing open water distance and larger waves is something that we've observed recently um, that is a pretty cool relationship where we see as um, there's increasing open water with less ice on the horizontal axis, we see larger waves forming um, on the vertical axis. So uh, this data was taken over the course of the season where early in the season where we had more ice, so it was more frozen up and so there's less distance and we get smaller waves 
more like we'd see on a lake. Later in the season, as, more, as there's less ice um, and there's more open water distance, we see larger waves forming, um, like in other oceans. And this relationship also indicates that over time, as I showed in this time series earlier, that we're having more open water in general in the Arctic, that we would expect to see larger waves in more recent years. So, in fact, we are seeing larger waves. And so, as I mentioned, I've been involved in doing research about waves in the Arctic. And this is a video that we took when we were up on a ship in the Arctic a year and a half ago. And I think it's really mesmerizing, but you can see that we saw these large waves uh, that are in the ice, and it looks really different than waves in the open ocean. But over just the course of a couple days, uh, this ice was gone. And so this is a video just a couple days later in approximately the same area that I took from the bridge of the ship. Um, and you can see that we're rolling back and forth a ton, but the waves here uh, were really large. They were up to about 15 feet, so close to two stories high. And as you can imagine, these waves are not just going to make the ship roll back and forth, but they're actually going to have a lot of effects on the ice and the ocean that are around. So there's a number of ways that waves can affect ice, and one that is most intuitive is that waves can break up ice cover. So especially when there's a more solid sheet of ice, like a, a, like a lake that's frozen up, uh, waves penetrating into it can break the ice into smaller pieces, and these pieces can easily be dispersed away and melted. So then this effect of waves breaking up ice is one that we can include in predictions of what the Arctic will look like. So this especially, uh, we can especially predict this if we have good indication of what the ice look like, looks like and how big the waves are. So waves can also impact ice in a number of other ways. And one is that wind and waves, um, particularly during storms in the Arctic, can melt ice by bringing up warmer water from below. So I want to help us understand this by picturing that we have a glass of warm soda. If we add ice to the glass, um, to represent the sea ice that we have in the Arctic. As this ice begins to melt, at the surface we'll have this cold layer of a combination of ice and water. But if we slosh the glass back and forth um, to create the waves like we're beginning to see in the Arctic, this will mix up some of the warm soda that's below and melt the ice even further. So this creates the kind of cycle that we're seeing in the Arctic where as there's more open water and less ice, we begin to see more waves forming um, that can help mix up warmer water from below and melt even more ice. <coughs> and so our research has been uh, trying to particularly understand this process. And one way we do this is by measuring the waves, such as during that large storm that I showed you the two videos from. Um, and so we do this using buoys. These are built at UW here in Seattle. And so they allow us to measure how fast the wind is blowing and the waves that form as a result, and also, really importantly, how much heat is in the ocean and how much mixing is happening. So this allows us to see over the course of a couple days where we see this loss of ice on the surface, the impact that the waves and the wind at the surface were having. And we see that wind and waves from storms can have this really big effect on the ice um, in the Arctic Ocean. The ocean is a big... Uh, source of heat and can store a lot of heat that could potentially melt a lot of ice. So understanding the effect that storms can have on melting that um, is an important thing to include in our predictions. So this process, as well as many of the others I've described, um, are part of what we've observed as the new Arctic. And of course, there's many others that we can include in our predictions to better understand what the ice might look like in the future. But ultimately, it results in an ice pack that looks more like we see here, where we have this ice that's thinner, less expansive, um, and it makes it really hard for the Arctic to catch up over time. So a lot of our progress in understanding this uh, system has been made by this uh, group of researchers that I've been fortunate to be a part of. Um, so. Uh, this project that we've uh, been working on is focusing on understanding changes in the Arctic in recent years. And this has been funded by the Office of Naval Research. So this is often surprising to a lot of people why the Navy would want to fund research in understanding the Arctic. But the Navy actually has a lot of interest in understanding the changes in this area. And this makes sense when we think back to this map that we looked at earlier, where we see a lot more open water in the Arctic now. Um, and so as a result, there's a lot of increase in ship traffic. Um, there's even been cruises in recent years to take tourists to see this really unique landscape. But we can also remember that 
in this ocean, we can still see really large waves. And the combination of waves with ice, like in the video I showed, can be really dangerous for ships if they're not prepared. So having better predictions of uh, what the waves and ice will look like in this area is important for the Navy as well as anyone who might be traveling to this area. So a number of us in this group have been focusing on improving our understanding of the processes in this uh, new Arctic, and then others are working on incorporating those into models that allow us to better predict what this area will look like in the future. So while before we were just observing these changes, um, and we saw, we saw that the ice was being lost, um, from 1980 to recent years, there's this huge loss of ice um, that's no longer freezing in the summer. Now we can begin to identify the processes uh, that are leading to these changes beyond just the warming. And so we can include these different processes and how important they are in our, to state-of-the-art predictions in order to better predict what the Arctic might look like in future years. And so with better predictions, managers of polar bear populations can better predict um, what they might need to ensure that polar bears have the food that they need to survive for many years to come. So with that, I just want to say thank you to uh, UW Engage Seminar, UW Science Now, and the Seattle Town Hall for making this talk possible. Um, and of course, the collaborators and uh, funding sources for supporting me throughout my research. Thanks. Am I supposed to just take this off? <laughs> All right, why are they doing that? I have a question for you. So um, your research was looking at, um, you know, sort of studying the waves in the Arctic. Do you um, have sort of any feeling for what aspect of the wave is most important? Like how high it is, how fast it's moving? Like what is the most important parameter? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the answer to that depends in many ways on what process uh, from the waves that we're trying to look at. Um, so for example, the two that I talked about in terms of waves breaking it up, um, breaking up the ice, that would depend um, in large part on how big the waves are and how so how long they are. Um, so kind of the distance between the peaks of the waves. Um, but for example, with um, you know this mixing that can occur from waves on the surface, um, that would similarly be a combination of the two, but for different reasons. The longer waves are much more likely to be mixing up uh, heat from below. So we need to understand both things about the waves. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.